on? Yes, I think we are. Let me throw this onto my pages real so let's quick. Let's wait a few. Okay. Until people start getting on. All right. I'm getting a lot of feedback from these Facebook Lives. You and I doing this together. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. Got it on there. Got it on there. There we go. <coughs> Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, welcome. Hello. Really glad you can join our live today. It's my husband and I just keep, you know, pushing in and answering questions. You had some things that you wanted to start off with. So, what's going on with you? What's going on Let's with talk, me? Let's talk about you and while people are signing on. <laughs> What's going on with you? Um, did you run this morning? Of course, I ran. How much, did, how much did you run? I ran four and a quarter miles, and I felt like a loser. Because <laughs> so. you only ran four and a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with you. Only running four and a quarter. Okay. What's up with that? I don't know. It's just yeah. You know, I was frustrated because I kept seeing these signs along the trail that say "stay six feet apart," and inside of me, I wanted to pick up the sign and throw them over the fence. Why? Uh, because I'm just done. <laughs> so. You're ready to go close to people. Yeah, I'm done. Just like this is great, you know. No social distancing well, I don't want you here. Getting close to other people like this. I know we're really close. Yeah, but you know, it's still just, just I feel like I'm being, I'm being, you know, told what to do. In it's just, it's just not right. You definitely don't like to be told what to do. No. So, yeah. uh, so anyway, um, I didn't throw any signs over the fences, but I thought That's about good. it. I thought about it. That's good. I fantasized about it. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So this is day, I've, I've lost count. How many days have we been on social distancing? Uh, at least two and a half weeks. And my big celebration this morning was because, and I heard that this was a strong possibility anyway, but um, I had started praying into the nation of China. My Lord laid some things on my heart, and I'm going to roll them out in, in a while. But, uh, um, but today on Passover, um, Wuhan was uh, released from their their. Uh, confinement, you know, the pandemic mm -hmm. confinement, and they celebrated. And I just think that, you know, it was such a, the Lord was, you know, it's almost like, it, it's hard for me not to read into that and say that the Lord is shouting, um, uh, you know, the blood of Jesus to mm -hmm. that territory. And, on Passover, the yeah, beginning on of Passover. Passover. Yeah, and just like like speaking to them through through that and saying, yeah. when you see the blood, I'll pass <clears> over <throat> you, and, and inviting them into relationship. Yeah with him those that don't know him and so so anyway I, that was that was just for, for me that was significant and special and that yeah. really got my day going in it in in a much better nice. way so and california's doing well we're doing well so mm -hmm. we're hopefully gonna... hopefully we're next yeah <laughs> next Lord. We'll, see. well we got to at least <laughs> april 30th we yeah so yeah so hopefully it'll end then yeah and, uh, so california is doing good but we're praying for new york and new yeah. jersey yeah and, Louisiana and all the other places that this thing needs to break right. and disappear. And, um, uh -huh. But just a thought, I think, from before we get into the questions. And, yeah. and if you're watching, um, you know, we got some questions that have already come in, but mm -hmm. if you have any questions, go ahead and post them. We'll, 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 we'll try. Yeah, we'll if, try we, to if see we them. catch them. So we're not always seeing what's on there. So if we catch them, we'll yeah. try to answer your questions also. Okay. But I think, um, so I'm going to date ours here a little bit. So do you remember when we were kids and we had, there was that movie called, um, it was a sequel, I forget the exact name, but Honey Who Shrunk the Kids or something oh, like yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So I think we were kids, right? I don't know. I don't know. It was a long time ago <laughs> and a lot of people watching probably don't even remember that movie, but if you don't remember that movie, it was it was like a sequel. So in one of them, the kids got shrunk really small, the yeah. other one, the dad got shrunk. Uh -huh. So everything else stayed the same size, but... The dad was the one who shrunk, so he had yeah. to maneuver uh, all these things, like the cat, the dog, or whatever, right. in the house, and everything else was, uh, you know, the same size. But they were the one that shrunk, but they looked like giants. So I think this morning, as I was praying, this, you know, I feel like the Lord put this thought in my heart. It's, uh, you know, when we go through things where the world is stressed out, or you know, whatever, or going through a pandemic, you know, it's, a, I guess, a pretty good. Big deal, not a good deal. Right, big it's, deal it's a big deal for the world. Um, I haven't been through a pandemic before. Have you? No. I don't know anybody's been through a pandemic. But I tend to minimize crisis. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> anyway, and it's like, eh, I've passed in a long time. This is only a pandemic. But um, but I remember. Uh, but it was this thought of you know when we go through things like this, 
everything seems to be so much bigger. Mm -hmm. But you know what? God has not shrunk. No. God has not shrunk. You know, he's he's still a deliverer. He's still a healer. He's still a provider. Amen. He's still all those things. Uh -huh. And what happens is when the world is going through something, our ask tends to shrink. Our yes. faith shrinks. Yeah. Everything else shrinks. But God has remained the same. So I just felt a challenge this morning is don't let your faith shrink during the season. Don't let mm. your asking shrink. Uh, stop, uh, don't start believing for less than what you were believing for a month ago. Right. Believe the same. If, if, if anything, believe for more. more because you do not want to let your faith shrink. You do no. not want to let your asking to shrink because I think there's a tendency that we think God uh, we tend to ask for less or the threshold that we're believing for becomes less right. because we think of what's going on in the world, then God's going to have a harder time getting the provision to us. Right. But, you know, God is the same. Nothing's he changed. doesn't change. So we have to make sure that when the pressure is on with us, that we don't let uh, what's inside of us shrink. Right. But we remain just as steadfast. And if anything, this is a time to let our faith increase. Right. And, and uh, just because the world is having less doesn't mean you have to have less because God is still Jehovah Jireh. You know, he's still your provider. Exactly. I, I guess my question for all of you, you know, just keying off of that is um, what is your vision once this ends? Because it's going to mm -hmm. come to a sudden end yeah. and it, it will end. This will pass. And what is your vision past that? And you can pretty much calculate what your where the direction of your life is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, by what you see beyond yeah. this. And so it's, it's important to, you know, get before the Lord and allow, you know, uh, you know, actually look into his face yeah. and, and see what he sees for your life, the life of your family, um, and have a vision so you don't perish, you know? Right. And so, so that's a prophetic vision, actually. It's like, this is what God is saying mm -hmm. and begin to declare it and call it out and let it be bigger in you yeah. than the present circumstances. And, um, you know, and just remember, it's going to pass. This is going to yeah. pass. We'll get through it. Because um, your future is not really in the future. Your future is in your heart. Yes, it is. You know, it's inside, so, the inside of you. Right. Okay. So um, I don't know if you want to go into some of, some sure, of these questions. Go for it. There's a lot of questions. Um, I don't. I think I want to split these actually between. We'll do some of them. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, "When did you know you were called to full time ministry, and what did you do prior to full time ministry?" Well, you take that because I've done nothing but ministry. Ah. Uh, so. Not. Not so. Um, Almost. Um, <laughs> um, when did you know? You know, for me, I was just um, very clearly, I fell in love with Jesus as a freshman in college. I didn't even consider. Or, and you fell in love with me. Yeah. All in the same year. Um, and I didn't even <clears throat> think about ministry. Like, it wasn't ministry to me. It was um, uh, serving Jesus. That, that's what it was to me because it was, because for me, everything was very relational and you do things for for those that you love okay so so in response i was you know serving the lord the best way that i knew how and and you know so that would mean you know telling people about him because you tell people about the one that you love that's right um i when i read the bible i i was learning that you lay hands on the sick and they recover i learned that you um believers in jesus cast out demons and so when opportunity came i would just step into that plus my church environments actually you know um at a certain point they they were you know pushing those kind of uh concepts so i wasn't like you know out on my own trying to do the supernatural i, I finally had some uh, a church environment that did that but at the same time you know there was a point in time um where where i became very aware inside of my own heart that I was going to marry uh, someone in ministry. I became very aware. Mm -hmm. I just didn't understand it. I remember I was playing the piano in my own house, uh, you know, one day, and I was playing, and it just, it just like a good pastor's wife. I know it, exactly. Piano. I was playing the piano, and it, mm -hmm. it just kind of, you know, um, rose up in my heart. And then, um, you know, and the Lord started talking to me about, you know, the qualifications of a bishop, and this is what I'm to look for. And He was really preparing me that I was going to marry a minister, but I was so new to all of that stuff. It was like. I was hearing it, I was following it, I was I was steering myself that direction, but there's a large part of me that didn't understand the reality of it until it showed up. And so, um, so you know, the Lord had a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and now, now yeah. Tell them how you caught me. How did I catch you? Since you found the bishop, you wanted to. Oh, my husband, yeah, my husband says that I gave him um, an inappropriate well, hug. Well, in, that's, that's how 
you met me. That, yeah. But then how did you tell me I was supposed to marry you? Oh, okay. Well, we should probably explain the inappropriate hug first because they're probably like, what? Well, you we know? were at a Christian um, <laughs> club gathering or yeah. ministry gathering yeah. on campus. Yeah. Uh, college campus. And uh, so it was kind of like, you know, when they, after worship or whatever, they tell you, greet somebody around you. My wife turned around and she gave me a non-Christian hug. Yeah. You all know what a non-Christian hug is, Yeah. Right? That's like a full yeah. full bear hug, you know? Yeah, not not the side hug. Yeah. I didn't know what a Christian hug was. I was just saved. So. Well, I had to say it for a while, so I knew exactly what that meant. I yeah. thought, this woman wants me. So anyway, so that was his yeah. signal. You know, mm -hmm. he, he took that as the big signal. And I, I've, Ron was like, you know, I was just really impressed with Ron's um, hunger for the Lord and his um, knowledge of the word. And so that caught me like right away. And then there's a point in time, um, you know, I would say that we had a friendship, but there was a point in time where uh, the Lord began to speak to him uh, about me. You know, again, the, the Lord knows and, and he prepares you. And so began to speak to him about me um, and about, about that um, uh, we were going to we were going to uh, have a, a marriage relationship at some point. Um, and and then I came up to him again, not knowing what the prophetic was. I just know that I heard the Lord. Yeah. And I went up to him and I said, the Lord told me to tell you that he really did show you who your wife is going to be, not knowing it was me. Okay. And so that was like, you know, and I was, played it off. I was like, oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyway, the, um, so, so it was like, you know, that was just, I think God and, Je you know, have, our heavenly father and Jesus were in the throne room, just hysterically laughing when, when this all went down because it, it was so funny. And so, you know. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we you know we we've, we've been partners in Christ ever since. In crime. Yeah. In, in Christ. Christ. <laughs> so since that would have been what 1989, 90? No, 90. Yeah. 1990. Yeah. And I said, what did you do prior to full time ministry? I just I just served the Lord. I served the Lord. I don't know. And you, found her husband. Yeah. So how about you? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. I got saved as a sophomore in high school, so then I was working already at a pizza place. So I was a pizza guy. Mm -hmm. I did that for six years and then went to college and then after college um, got into ministry. So really, in, I, after 18, basically, after my college years, really ministry is all I've, full-time ministry is all I've done. But I, I think um, one thing to keep in mind, I think to, to go off of some of what you were saying, Jen, mm -hmm. is... You know, ministry is not a position. Mm -mm. So it's not like once you get that quote, that position or that title or that paycheck or whatever, then you're in ministry. You're actually in ministry the moment you get saved. And and I, and I understand what they're talking about. They're talking about the fivefold ministry. Yeah. But the fivefold is still not a staff, necessarily a staff or paid position. Yeah. Is you're either a pastor, no matter what you're doing or you're not and so forth. So yeah. really, if I think some of that question goes into you know, how do I get into ministry and all those, and that kind of right, thing. Right, right. But I would say, no, ministry really comes out of your relationship with Jesus. So you don't have a, I think some people have a relationship with Jesus because they're in ministry. But I think your ministry has to come out of your relationship. So if God's called you to the fivefold, just pursue him with all your heart. And out of that comes the open doors and the ministry. That's you know, true. I, th I think one of the hangups I had because you know we're both first generation um, in the ministry and Christians and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, you know my thing especially back then you know back in the 80s and 90s in our denominational setting whatever it was kind of like you got to know somebody you know you got to staff position because right. you knew somebody right. and I remember telling the Lord one day when I was at ORU I said God I don't know anybody and my father wasn't a pastor and the Lord just whispered in my heart he says but you know me Right. And uh, so, it's, you know, the Lord's the one who opens the doors for you. It's true. Just pursue Him and let the doors open because yeah. He's the one who opens them. That's true. It says, uh, what would you say to your young ministry self if you were starting all over again? I think I said that last week. But it was, <laughs> I think the number one thing that you could say is not everything is such a big deal. Yeah. Don't stress out about everything. Right. Uh, I guess when your young ministry self is often thrown into situations beyond your experience, mm -hmm. beyond your expertise, beyond your capacity, um, and the Lord is actually building your muscles and mm -hmm. building your faith. And um, which, you know, in principle, I've I've known this from day one, and I've just taken comfort in it that those who overcome get nations. And that's out of mm -hmm. Revelations 2, verse mm -hmm. 26. 
And, um, you know, maybe it's not specifically speaking to the nations, but those who overcome get rewarded yeah. um, because the Lord is looking for those who will be found faithful and those who are good stewards. And when he finds those kind of people, uh, then he actually entrusts you with, with more yeah. according to his purposes for your life. And so, so um, uh, you know, I had to learn that early um, to, that, that there's always a reward to overcoming and as tough as it could be at times or look impossible or look like everything's falling apart, you know, uh, you know, it, the Lord always came through. Um, but I had to just really position my heart and my faith to trust the Lord. And it's always in dimensions that I didn't know I had to trust him, trust him in that in that way or that mm-hmm. level. And so he's always come through. Well, let me ask that question a different way. Uh uh-huh. um, you know, obviously, the, the the most challenging things for us right now are probably very different yeah. than the most challenging things back when we were young in ministry. Totally. So the question I would ask is, what was the most difficult things when you were young in ministry? Why don't you answer that first? What's the most difficult? Yeah. I think two, two parts. I think yeah. one was um, kind of like off of what I said earlier. Is not everything is a big deal. So learning how to carry, learning how to carry stress, learning how to carry the burden of the ministry and the organization in which you're carrying. But I think the other one is also um, not getting into the relational dysfunction with dysfunctional people. Yeah. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's good. I think there's hurtful, hurting people, so therefore they're hurtful people, they're dysfunctional. Mm. And it seems like the dysfunctional people that go to church, they're also like one-uppers in, in the sense of, they think they have it all together, and then they want to tell you how you should do stuff, right? Having no experience at all. Yeah, they don't know jack. <laughs> anyway, but um, so. so then what happens is I think there's a tendency in mm-hmm. ministers to mm-hmm. want to please. Yeah. And then I then so, so you get into a dysfunctional relationship with people. Yeah. And I think that there's this other thing that's like innate, I think, in ministers that we think we could help everybody. So whoever... I don't think that. I, well, not anymore. <laughs> But we think we could help everybody. So it's like, so these people come to your church and they tell you all the, t- the previous 10 churches they've been to and how terrible the pastor was. And mm-hmm. and then, and you know these pastors, these are great pastors. And you're mm-hmm. like, but something on the inside of you says, but I think I could help them. And then, no, nope. You, you can't help then them. Then they leave and you're, you suck just like the other guys did. Uh-huh. And then you realize <laughs> you can't help everyone, you know? Right. So just don't get into the dysfunctional relationships with people. So I think the the best way to do that is to make sure you work on yourself. Make sure you're healthy, because the healthier you are, the more than you um, discern the unhealthy people. Yeah, and they don't really get a hook on you either, because yeah. you know don't have there's nothing in you. You don't have anything yeah. in common yeah. uh, within your own heart, and so that's really powerful. Yeah, and I think uh, Jimmy Evans, I heard him once say, you know, you married at the level to the level of your dysfunction. Right, so you marry somebody else at the same level of dysfunction that you are. So, mm-hmm. really healthy people don't meet, don't marry really unhealthy people. That's we, te- true. we tend to marry at the level of our dysfunction. Right, and I think it's the same with ministry. You right. tend to get entangled with people at the level of your dysfunction. <laughs> so true. So stay healthy. Yeah, so true. That, that's that's a reality that maybe a lot of us need to consider. I've told other ministers before that you can tell who you are by what mm-hmm. you attract. It's true. And and that's that's a tough reality. It's a tough pill to swallow. But the good news is if you will recognize it, if there if there's a problem, yeah. if you recognize it, you can change it. But that just says you're going to have to go yeah. do some work. If all your people are weirdos. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's something in you that draws them. I yeah. That's the reality. So, okay. Um, in having long-term visions and goals, here's another question. How do you practically make small steps every day to get there? Um, I'll, I'll lead on that one. Okay. Um, I have um, a lot of short-term um, stuff, and uh, then I have long-term stuff. And I, at this stage, I'm patient in the sense of this. Um, I know I'm going to get there, but I'm going to press into it one step at a time. Yeah. But I always keep it before me. So, so if I know that I know that I know that this is where God is leading me, I keep it before me. Some things I need God to open the door on, and I can't, I can't make a move mm-hmm. until he gives me an instruction or he opens a door. And so I keep it in front of my prayer team. I keep it before the Lord, and I just wait. Um, because, uh, you know, though the vision tarry, it will come to pass. Mm-hmm. All right, other things, I just start moving forward step by step. 
uh, you know, for example, um, I've desired to have uh, a Sears and Profits Institute in another country. And so I'm starting to narrow in now, step by step, and it's, it's, it's been in my heart, but now we're, we're getting into the steps of potentially putting it into Australia. Um, it'll be on a smaller scale at first, and I'm okay with that. Um, but, you know, you just step by step, and then, and then we'll see how it goes, and then evaluate. And, you know, it just, I'm okay with that, but I don't need to swiftly, um, manically lay hold of every single vision right here, right now. It's, I'm, very, um, I'm very methodical in that sense, but, but I am diligent. Okay. How do I do it? Um, let's see. It, I say analyze me. How do okay. I do it? It begins as a seed in his heart, and then I'll, I'll, I will listen, and he, it will pop out of his mouth the first time. And then I'm like, I usually just kind of, you know, take it in. And then when I hear it the second time, okay, and then when I hear it the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, then I know that it's going to happen eventually. Mm -hmm. And then there's this point where he talks about it all day, nonstop. And that's when I know we're about ready. About to give birth. Yeah, we're about ready to give birth to whatever it is that's been brewing in his heart. And it's a little bit of a shocker for me to, you know, I, I have to sometimes just adjust to it just like anybody else because there's usually some sort of recalibration within our, our structure or within our routine um, to adjust to the sudden birth. <laughs> But I can't, I can't say that I didn't see it coming. Just sometimes I'm in denial because I'm not ready mm -hmm. to quite adjust to what he just, the, to, the, to the, the enlargement of our world that he just, he just you know, gave birth to. So. Hmm. That's a pretty good analysis. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't mean I don't do anything practically every day. No, I no. Think practically, I prepare myself. I think I prepare the organization mm -hmm. because, you know, the things I believe for and the things I have vision for, God's going to have to do it. They're big things like you're saying. Yeah. But I sit there and I start thinking on my part, I start thinking, what do I have to change in the organization, in the church, in my routine, in my structure, mm -hmm. so that when this thing happens, we could carry it? Yeah. So like, I think a practical example of that is uh, a few months ago, before this whole you know, corona thing happened, uh, a few months ago, the Lord spoke to me very clearly in time of prayer. He says, prepare for the fire and prepare for the harvest. So he's bringing a, uh, an, a renewing fire to our church, and he's going to bring a great harvest, a right. greater harvest than we've seen mm. into our church. So right. practically, then one day, a few days later, it occurred to me, you can't just have the harvest and then start making room for it. you got to make room for it now. Right. So I started putting plans together. We started doing different things to enlarge our facilities to enlarge our rooms to do different things mm. to prepare for when the harvest comes so you did all of that out of a prophetic word to your own heart the Lord just speaking yeah to me. Mm -hmm. yeah because if you don't make any practical steps towards what God's put in your heart then you don't really believe what's in your heart that's true that's, right yeah that's true why don't we uh, hit um, one or two more questions okay. okay how do you think the church will look after this pandemic is over with face masks. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope not. That was so weird. I was at the store yesterday and all these people have face masks, masks I on. I know, I missed the notice. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my gosh. I don't watch the news, so. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? You could go into a bank nowadays with a face mask and rob it and nobody will know what you look like. That's true. That's so true. Something, crazy. Something crazy about that. So hopefully not face masks. I mean, I've been in China like three times and I'm accustomed to face masks over there. I'm accustomed to wearing face masks over there, um, but not not everywhere, you know. So that, it's kind of like, okay, I feel a little bit of an encroachment, <laughs> you know, in that sense. Um, what I think I think the church is going to look a lot more online. I think mm -hmm. the church is going, and it needs to. But I think I think I think that's not going to replace though the human contact. No, it doesn't. I it, think pastors no. are discovering the tools for online ministry and right. the stuff that we've been doing for the last two years. Yeah. I think um, pretty much every other church has had to jump on it uh -huh. because of this. Yeah. Uh, but I think even for us, what was different is all the FaceTime. Like this, I've never been doing fa live stuff mm -mm. until this happened. But um, I don't know. Maybe I'll still be doing it afterwards. Welcome. But, Welcome. But, but the thing <laughs> is, uh, I think the other part of that, so I think the flip side of that also is we're realizing how much we also need the human contact. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, I think God is bringing a great harvest into the church right. as a result of this. Right. I, you know, just and then the practicality is, you know, human contact. You know, there's the the gathering element, person to person, mm-hmm. the one on ones. There's these methods. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I just think this has has enlarged our world uh, in a sense. I've been I've been doing this kind of thing for quite a while now, so I'm I'm accustomed to it. And then yeah. um, bringing people from my online community into uh, in-person uh, contact uh, as well and trying to work through that and you know so so I just think I think that there's just going to be um, an, an additional reach through technology that's really what I think um, I'm wondering if eventually everything will go virtual and, no. you know, you know what I don't I don't think so no because remember last year when I thought we could do all our growth track stuff online yeah and it, it just sucked. fell apart it big time <laughs> because you still have to have the church is about the interaction, right? You know, right. Um, you know, Book of Acts. They met daily. Yeah, they got together daily. Right. Now again, for us, that doesn't mean humanly meeting together every day, but there has to be continual contact. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of back and forth and experimentation. Yeah. In in those realms. So, who are some historical figures who have influenced you the most? Historical figures. Um, so I guess that could mean like preachers or. No, no, huh? I, I, you know. What does that mean? There was a season that I was just really um, reading the biographies of people who were um, able to to move cultures and move hmm. so, move things socially. You know, for, for essentially, um, you know, political leaders or um, yeah, hmm. I would say so. Uh, you know, those kind of people. And I, I know it's a controversial figure, but I read the biographies, or, or a couple of them, uh, from Nelson Mandela. And I just really, you know, I just liked the mentality of someone who's, who's you know, really examining how to bring freedom to his people mm-hmm. and just um, paying the price and paying the cost. And so, you know, I, I felt in my own heart when he died. You know, I'm like, what a loss, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, so that, that was a figure that I really, I really enjoyed. How about you? Mine are all preachers. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I think I think we are drawn historically uh, to historical people mm. that walked in the gift that God's put on the inside of us. So I think the people that historically I've been drawn to have been preachers who've operated mm-hmm. in faith. Okay. I think like Kenneth Hagin's been a great influence on my life. Um, which maybe we'll leave that for another Q and A session. But yeah, you know, I've had three significant dreams from the Lord. I have had many, but three significant dreams from the Lord where I see an impartation and all three of them, Kenneth Hagin showed up in. So anyway, right, right. but he's been a big figure. I think Smith Wigglesworth mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, people like that who've operated in great faith. Right. Because I think that's, that's uh, something God's put in my life. And um, so I think we're drawn to people because we learn from their life and how they walked in it. Because, you know, when God puts a call in your life and a gift in you, mm-hmm. uh, you don't have to try to figure out all yourself. Go back in history and see how other people successfully did it. Right, right. Okay, how about this one? This is a big one. All right. How do you handle a person on your team when they've broken your trust but they truly repent? Then you... Maybe this came from one of our staff. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it depends It depends on what, what happened. Okay, there's different levels of trust breaking. Um, I, what does I'm, that mean? What do you mean different meaning, levels of okay, trust breaking? Okay, so... Um, so I'm I'm very forgiving, you know, in the sense of I, I really believe if somebody like truly repents from the heart, then you know that is I, I believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I go with it. Now if they kept doing it, okay, even though they're repenting from the heart, I'd be like, okay, we're gonna have to make a change. What does that mean? Make um, a change. Well, it it just depends on what what happened, you mm. know, and and so um, like I have some teams some. Um, personal prayer teams that it's it's very strict in the sense of this um confidentiality is not mm-hmm. going to be broken if it's no. broken you're you're moved off the team and you're not coming back on ever no <laughs> so, ever ever no <laughs> so wow <laughs> but but i'm saying that you you have to keep my confidentiality and i'm not mm-hmm. kidding um so but i've made that really plain and i, I don't have that with all my prayer teams i have that with a, a few sets of people because I need that safety, um, you know, and and you know, so I don't I don't feel bad saying that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what would you say to that? 
<laughs> I th again, I, I think you're right. The contexts are mm -hmm. very different. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think what Sam Chanda says, reality, uh, trust is repeated reality. Yeah. So in a sense of, um, you know, say, so, well, you, there's there's a lot of people that believe mm -hmm. that you should trust them. You should you should start with like all this amount of trust. No. And <laughs> you know that sounds great. That's... There's a lot of stuff out there that just sounds great, but it's all theory, right? Nobody's yeah, actually done it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, the the thing is, yeah, I I always give my team a certain amount of trust to begin with. Yeah. I mean they they don't start at zero. They start at a certain level of trust. Otherwise, why are they on your team? Exactly. Yeah. But. The trust from there is earned. Mm -hmm. So, but one of the things we have to understand is, again, so trust has trust earned by repeated reality that somebody is trustworthy, mm -hmm. right? So, but you have to always remember trust is gained in spoonfuls, but it's lost in bucketfuls. Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, trust doesn't all of a sudden is not gained back at the same speed that it's lost. Yeah. And I think that's the thing you have to. Uh, realize now there are two aspects of this so you have to remember there's a spiritual aspect to this and there's a practical aspect the spiritual aspect is you uh, mess up you break the trust you betray you do whatever I'll forgive you um, I'll definitely forgive you because yeah, that's absolutely. Well, that's what we're supposed to do right? right forgive if you want to be forgiven so forgiving someone and having them still on the team are not the same thing yeah um, I I, I still not realize how well, how could you still love somebody but fire them <laughs> or remove them off your team? Yeah. But actually, you can. Yeah. I, you know, you repent, and I love you. And even if you don't repent, I still love you. Uh, but if you've lost enough trust with me where you can't be on the team, you're not going to be on the team. Yeah. Because trust is really important. Right. And uh, because I have to feel safe mm -hmm. with the people that are on my team that are around me. So if I don't feel safe, mm -hmm. uh, then you can't be on the team. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean you're not a good person. Yeah. It just means you can't be on the team. So what happens is people have these false expectations. They think, well, I repented, so you should have forgiven me. Well, I did forgive you. Well, if you forgave me, how come I'm not on the team anymore? Well, forgiveness, the spiritual part and the practical part, you know, they have different um, consequences. Exactly. It doesn't mean you're not forgiven. It doesn't mean you're not loved. It's just the consequences of it are, are different. And I and I love the um, you know practical side of that is again what Sam Chan says. Mm -hmm. You would think Sam Chan and I talk every day. Anyway, what Sam know. Chan says he says you know the uh, you know conflict is the gap between reality and expectation, right? Yes. So so the thing is you, you have different expectations of different teams that you have. So. The, the more the reality is off from what you expected, then there's that conflict, and you can't have that. So you, you have to be able to trust the people around you. Yeah. Um, so, and that's the thing. So I think even as, not only as leaders, but followers, team members, you know, either part, I think we have to make sure um, we are people that do not want to lose trust with people mm -hmm. because it's really hard to gain it back. You know, there's yeah. that real practical side. So we want to make sure... Um, I don't know if that does that answer it. I, I think that answered it perfectly, um, and it just you know, and I think it's balanced. Okay, so, how about this one? How, how, what do you? What I need to do to attain spiritual gifts? Oh, really? As outlined in First Corinthians. 12. Really, really simple. Well, we'll jump to First Corinthians fourteen to answer your question about First Corinthians twelve, where it says um, pursue spiritual gifts. Um, uh, or it says, uh, you know, yeah, pursue spiritual gifts and especially that you would prophesy. Um, and so uh, the pursuit is desire. Um, uh, you want to desire those spiritual gifts. And what I know about the Holy Spirit is he um, wholeheartedly wants to give you those gifts. And so with your desire, bring mm -hmm. it to him, uh, you know, he will meet you and answer you. And then the rest of it is stewarding those gifts. So that means I'm going to study them. I'm going to um, perhaps uh, go to some conferences or some learning learning environments so that I can be activated in those gifts. Whatever you steward um, is going to grow in your life. And so, um, you know, that, that would be the way to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more question. Uh, last one. Last one. All right. So it's a leadership question. Okay. It goes back to the whole team thing. Mm -hmm. What do you do with a team member who has a bad chemistry with the rest of the team? 
Yikes. And especially when they are really strong workers, sometimes that's a, that's a dynamic that's mm. tough. <laughs> so they're, so they're strong workers, but they don't get along with people. Right. Yeah. So, and then the debate is, do I stick you in a room by yourself <laughs> um, and not let you out because mm. I value what you do more than I value your, your ability to get along with people? Or do I, because of your attitude, release you even though I really am so uh, you're just such a workhorse you know and I have to those are those are tough dynamics um, and you have to sometimes it, it depends on where you're at um, and, and you know as a church you know how it is sometimes mm -hmm. like this is all I have like this is this is all the team I have this is yeah. all that's in my hand and I have to do the best I can I prefer that people be have good chemistry that's my preference it's not always reality and sometimes people can't change, but um, mm. you know we always want the ideal where there's good yeah. chemistry and a good strong work ethic, and yeah. that would be ideal. Yeah, in 20, how long have I been doing this? 20, 20 over 20 years. Over 20 years. Mm. So you learn a lot. Yeah, you learn a lot, and especially yeah. you know we've, we have a pretty good sized church, so we've had a lot of staff, and a lot of staff have come through mm. over the years. Yes. Um, I think mm -hmm. you learn over the years. So I think my, my answer today is different than what my answer would have been even five years ago. Yeah. And I think today I would say um, I would not keep somebody who cannot have good chemistry with the entire team. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care how hard they work. Right. I appreciate the hard work. Yeah. I like hard work, but I wouldn't keep them because then it deteriorates the, 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 the team morale. dynamic. The morale, the rest yeah. of them. Because I, because that's at some level, I think, yeah. especially the larger the organization grows, the church that's grows, the key. Yeah. you can no longer achieve what you need to achieve. You cannot achieve greatness because one person mm -hmm. is a hard worker. Right. You have to achieve the things that God's called you to because the entire team is able to move together cohesively and effectively. So you cannot have one person who deteriorates that because of the bad chemistry. You know, the four things I look for in any team member, mm -hmm. so if I'm hiring someone or, you know, what I look at team members is, number one, you know, the, we call them the four C's, right? Mm -hmm. So do they have character? Mm -hmm. So I don't care how good they work, if they don't have character, you're gone. Right. You know, do they have competency? So yeah. that's the second C. In other words, can, can they do the job? So, oh, oh, but they got a great heart. Yeah. You know, well, I'm glad they got a great heart. They have great character, but mm -hmm. you also have to have competency, right? Right. It says in Psalms about David, it says he shepherded God's people with the integrity of heart and the skill of his hand. So you got to have character and you got to have competency, right? And then the third C is chemistry. So do they have the right chemistry, first of all, with me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because you know, I've decided I will never again, so that means I've had it before, mm -hmm. I will never again have people on my team that I have to walk on eggshells around. Yeah. Right. Well, what about when they have good chemistry with you, but not you, with the rest of the team? But nobody else. That that's it's tricky because we've had those situations. Well, they have to. It's not an option. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, but the reality is, I think sometimes when you're the boss, you don't realize this. But, you don't realize. But the rest of your staff tell you about how everybody has good chemistry with you, but they're not having good chemistry with one another. I know, and it's hard. It's and hard you're to. Like, Wait a minute, but they they're good to me. Yeah. That's because I'm the boss. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So, but no, they have to have good chemistry first with you, but also with the entire team. That's yeah. important. Yeah. And then the third, then the fourth C is capacity. Uh -huh. So, in other words, can are they not only competent for where we are now? Do they have the capacity to grow for where we're going in the future? Yeah. And knowing, like what you were saying about me earlier, knowing me, uh -huh. we're not staying where we are right now. No. We're constantly growing. We're moving forward. We're expanding. So the thing is. They might have the competence for now, but do they have the capacity to grow for the next place that we're going to go? Right. If they don't have capacity, then they can't be on the team either. Right. So, you know, it's kind of like that old, you know, saying you got to grow, you, you, you grow it. or you got to go. Yeah. You know, so, and, and that's one of the hardest things. I think um, in, in talking to other pastors of large churches and growing churches, I think one of the greatest challenges for us is Sometimes you'll have people on your team who are great people, you mm -hmm. love them, and they did such a great job at the last yeah. level you were at. For sure. But now, at this next level that you're going to, they are struggling, and they seem to not have the capacity to grow to that next level. So what, what happens is, you know, because we're loyal, I'm, I'm a loyal person, I'm loyal to people who've been loyal, 
And uh, so you don't want to have to ever release someone because they've been good people, they've been loyal, they've had you know good yeah. chemistry, but they can't they, they can't, can't grow, grow to the next level. That's a, yeah, and that's a really tough one. But I think at the, ultimately you have to remember, and, and that's something the Lord's just really been dealing with me recently in recent months, is I am a steward of the ministry of the church of the organization that God has. Mm-hmm. Put, put me in charge of. Mm-hmm. So am I willing to make the church less effective because I really like somebody on my team? Yeah. Even though even though I've worked with them and they just don't have the capacity to go to the next level. Right. And that's a really hard thing. I think that's hard for the leader, but that's also hard for the people. You know, it's like, you got rid of him. He's such a great person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is a great person. But because here's the thing. If I'm frustrated because they don't have the capacity, I'll guarantee you they are also frustrated. Right. Because I'm not going to just let you <laughs> stay where you are. I'm going to keep pushing you. And if you're not able to grow, I'm sure you're frustrated too. And you know what? And life is too short to live frustrated. It sure is. So it's better to remain friends and love each other, but then that go, person goes someplace go where they and, could not be, where they're not frustrated. Yeah, go ahead and, and make that shift, make that change. Yeah. I think with church, we, we always... We don't want to change things. We we don't want to rock the boat. And yeah. and these are the tough decisions that we have to make. You know. Um, That's why leadership is not for sissies. No, it isn't. Mm-hmm. You know. So, all right. Thank you so much why, for. Why don't you pray for them? For okay, let me pray uh, for all of you, and um, we'll close out. Okay. So, Heavenly Father, we just yes. thank you for your your tremendous presence upon yes. your church in this hour. Uh, Lord, that you are speaking to our hearts, you are counseling us, you're give, you've given to us um, your Holy Spirit for wisdom and revelation. I pray, Lord, for every person that they have a vision yes, um, past this season, yeah. a vision from you, that, Lord, for those who are anxious and worried and concerned, that, Lord, your peace would overwhelm them right yes. now and they would yes. be solid and stable and hear your voice and be led by your voice uh, yes. from the inside. And, Lord, I thank you that you are uh, causing your church to unify even more. Yes. And we thank you most of all that you are the Lord of the breakthrough. Yeah. And, and Lord, as, as quickly as this came, mm. as suddenly as this came, it will suddenly That's end. Right. And we decree it. In in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Bless you guys. We'll see you. Bye.